My name is Olaf Jansen. I am a Norwegian, although I was born in the little seafaring Russian town of Yuliaburg, on the eastern coast of the Gulf of Bothnia, the northern arm of the Baltic Sea. My parents were on a fishing cruise in the Gulf of Bothnia and put into this Russian town of Yuliaburg at the time of my birth, being the 27th day of October, 1811. My father, Jens Jansen, was born at Rodwig on the Scandinavian coast near the Lofoten Islands, but after marrying made his home at Stockholm because my mother's people resided in that city. When seven years old, I began going with my father on his fishing trips along the Scandinavian coast. Early in life, I displayed an aptitude for books, and at the age of nine years was placed in a private school in Stockholm, remaining there till I was 14. After this, I made regular trips with my father on all his fishing voyages. My father was a man fully six feet three in height and weighed over 15 stone, a typical Norseman of the most rugged sort and capable of more endurance than any other man I have ever known. He possessed the gentleness of a woman in tender little ways, yet his determination and willpower were beyond description. His will admitted of no defeat. I was in my 19th year when we started on what proved to be our last trip as fishermen, and which resulted in a strange story that shall be given to the world, but not until I have finished my earthly pilgrimage. I dare not allow the facts as I know them to be published while I am alive, for fear of further humiliation confinement and suffering. First of all, I was put in irons by the captain of the whaling vessel that rescued me for no other reason than that I told the truth about the marvelous discoveries made by my father and myself. But this was far from being the end of my tortures. After four years and eight months absence, I reached Stockholm, only to find my mother had died the previous year, and the property left by my parents in the possession of my mother's people, but it was at once made over to me. All might have been well had I erased from my memory the story of our adventure and of my father's terrible death. Finally, one day, I told the story in detail to my uncle, Gustav Osterland, a man of considerable property, and urged him to fit out an expedition for me to make another voyage to the strange land. First, I thought he favored my project. He seemed interested, and invited me to go before certain officials and explain to them, as I had to him, the story of our travels and discoveries. Imagine my disappointment and horror when, upon the conclusion of my narrative, certain papers were signed by my uncle, and without warning, I found myself arrested and hurried away to dismal and fearful confinement in a madhouse, where I remained for twenty-eight years, long, tedious, frightful years of suffering. I never ceased to assert my sanity, and to protest against the injustice of my confinement. Finally, on the 17th of October, 1862, I was released. My uncle was dead and the friends of my youth were now strangers. Indeed, a man over fifty years old, whose only known record is that of a madman, has no friends. I was at a loss to know what to do for a living, but instinctively turned toward the harbor where fishing boats in great numbers were anchored, and within a week I had shipped with a fisherman by the name of Jan Hansen, who was starting on a long fishing cruise to the Lofoten Islands. Here my earlier years of training proved of the very greatest advantage, especially in enabling me to make myself useful. This was but the beginning of other trips, and by frugal economy I was, in a few years, able to own a fishing brig of my own. For twenty-seven years thereafter I followed the sea as a fisherman, five years working for others, and the last twenty-two for myself. During all these years I was a most diligent student of books, as well as a hard worker at my business, but I took great care not to mention to anyone the story concerning the discoveries made by my father and myself. Even at this late day I would be fearful of having anyone see or know the things I am writing, and the records and maps I have in my keeping. When my days on earth are finished, I shall leave maps and records that will enlighten, and I hope, benefit mankind. The memory of my long confinement with maniacs, and all the horrible anguish and sufferings are too vivid to warrant my taking further chances. In 1889 I sold out my fishing boats and found I had accumulated a fortune quite sufficient to keep me the remainder of my life. I then came to America. For a dozen years my home was in Illinois, near Batavia, where I gathered most of the books in my present library, though I bought many choice volumes from Stockholm. Later I came to Los Angeles, arriving here March 4, 1901, the date I well remember, as it was President McKinley's second inauguration that day. I bought this humble home and determined here in the privacy of my own abode sheltered by my own vine and fig tree, and with my books about me to make maps and drawings of the new lands we had discovered, and also to write the story in detail from the time my father and I left Stockholm, until the tragic event that parted us in the Antarctic Ocean. I well remember that we left Stockholm in our fishing sloop on the third day of April, 1829, and sailed to the southward, leaving Gotland Island to the left and Oland Island to the right. A few days later we succeed in doubling Sandholmar Point, 
and made our way through the Sound, which separates Denmark from the Scandinavian coast. In due time we put in at a town of Christiansand, where we rested two days, and then started round the Scandinavian coast to the westward, bound for the Lofoten Islands. My father was in high spirit because of the excellent and gratifying returns he had received from our last catch by marketing at Stockholm, instead of selling at one of the seafaring towns along the Scandinavian coast. He was especially pleased with the sale of some ivory tusks that he had found on the west coast of Franz Joseph Land during one of his northern cruises the previous year, and he expressed the hope that this time we might again be fortunate enough to load our little fishing sloop with ivory instead of cod, herring, mackerel, and salmon. We put in at Hammerfest, latitude 71 degrees and 40 minutes, for a few days rest. Here we remained one week, laying in an extra supply of provisions and several casks of drinking water, and then sailed towards Spitsbergen. For the first few days we had an open sea and favoring wind, and then we encountered much ice and many icebergs. A vessel larger than our little fishing sloop could not possibly have threaded its way among the labyrinth of icebergs or squeezed through the barely open channels. These monster bergs presented an endless succession of crystal palaces, massive cathedrals, and fantastic mountain ranges, grim and sentinel-like, immovable as some towering cliff of solid rock, standing silently as sphinx resisting the restless waves of a fretful sea. After many narrow escapes, we arrived at Spitsbergen on the 23rd of June and anchored at Y Jade Bay for a short time, where we were quite successful in our catches. We then lifted anchor and sailed through the Hinlopen Strait and coasted along the northeast land in set two. It will be remembered that Andre started on his fatal balloon voyage from the northwest coast of Spitsbergen, so several times during this we'll interject with notes. They started along the Hinlopen Strait and coasted along the northeast land. A strong wind came up from the southwest and my father said that we had better take advantage of it and try to reach Franz Joseph Land, where the year before he had by accident found the ivory tusks that had brought him such a good price at Stockholm. Never before or since have I seen so many sea fowl. They were so numerous that they hid the rocks on the coastline and darkened the sky. For several days we sailed along the rocky coast of Franz Joseph Land. Finally, a favoring wind came up that enabled us to make the west coast, and, after sailing 24 hours, we came to a beautiful inlet. One could hardly believe it was the north end. The place was green with growing vegetation, where while the area did not comprise more than one or two acres, yet the air was warm and tranquil. It seemed to be at that point where the Gulf Stream's influence is most keenly felt. Inset Sir John Barrow Bart, in his work entitled Voyages of Discovery, and research within the Arctic regions, says on page 57, Mr. Beachy refers to what has frequently been found and noticed, the mildness of the temperature on the western coast of Spitsbergen, there being little or no sensation of cold, though the thermometer might be only a few degrees above the freezing point, the brilliant and lively effect of a clear day, when the sun shines forth with a pure sky, whose azure hue is so intense as to find no parallel even in the boasted Italian sky, and will note in the other documents that we'll get to that they talk about the same thing that once they reach a certain distance north that it ceases to become so cold on the east coast there were numerous icebergs yet here we were in open water far to the west of us however were ice packs and still farther to the westward the ice appeared like ranges of low hills in front of us and directly to the north lay an open sea Captain Kane on page 299, quoting from Morton's journal, 26 December, says, As far as I could see, the open passages are 15 miles or more wide, with sometimes mashed ice separating them. But it is all small ice, and I think it either drives out to the open space to the north or rots and sinks, as I could see none ahead to the north. And we'll notice that in the other portions where this is the main hindrance to travelers trying to get there, that it's the ice pack its early onset in winter and its late leaving in the summer makes it that there's very little time where you can safely get through the, the ice pack and get to the actual area of the pole. So it would be known, that's why it's known as the land beyond the north. And we'll get into later the actual, and you'll see it here as we go through in the photos, you'll see the actual route that these people took to get there. My father was an ardent believer in Odin and Thor, and had frequently told me they were gods who came from far beyond the north wind. There was a tradition, my father explained, that still farther northward was a land more beautiful than that any mortal had ever known, 
and that it was inhabited by the Chosen. We find the following in Dutch mythology, page 778 from the pen of Jacob Grimm. Then the sons of Bor, as in Borea, or Hyperbore, built in the middle of the universe the city called Asgard, where dwell the gods and their kindred, and from that abode work out so many wondrous things, both on the earth and in the heavens above it. There is in that city a place called Hidskalf, and when Odin is seated there, upon his lofty throne, he sees over the whole world and discerns all the actions of men. My youthful imagination was fired by the ardor, zeal, and religious fervor of my good father, and I exclaimed, Why not sail to this goodly land? The sky is fair, the wind favorable, and the sea open. From Plato He is the god who sits in the center, on the navel of the earth, and he is the interpreter of religion to all mankind. Plato Even now I can see the expression of pleasurable surprise on his countenance, as he turned toward me and asked, My son, are you willing to go with me and explore? To go far beyond? where man has ever ventured? I answered affirmatively. Very well, he replied. May the god Odin protect us. And, quickly adjusting the sails, he glanced at our compass, turned the prow in due northerly direction through an open channel, and our voyage had begun. Hall writes on page 288 on 23rd January, the two Eskimo, accompanied by two of the seamen, went to Cape Lupton. They reported a sea of open water extending as far as the eye could reach. The sun was low in the horizon, as it was still the early summer. Indeed, we had almost four months of day ahead of us before the frozen night could come on again. Our little fishing sloop sprang forward as if eager as ourselves for adventure. Within thirty-six hours we were out of sight of the highest point on the coastline of Franz Joseph Land. We seemed to be in a strong current running north by northeast. Far to the right and to the left of us were icebergs, but our little sloop bore down on the narrows and passed through channels and out into open seas channel so narrow in places that, had our craft been other than small, we could never have gotten through. On the third day we came to an island. Its shores were washed by an open sea. My father determined to land and explore for a day. This new land was destitute of timber, but we found a large accumulation of driftwood on the northern shore. Some of the trunks of the trees were forty feet long and two feet in diameter. Greeley tells us in volume one, page one, that Privates Connell and Frederick found a large coniferous tree on the beach just above the extreme high water mark. It was nearly 30 inches in circumference, some 30 feet long, and had apparently been carried to that point by a current within a couple of years. A portion of it was cut up for firewood, and for the first time in that valley, a bright, cheery campfire gave comfort to men. After one day's exploration off of the coast of this land, we lifted anchor and turned our prow to the north in an open sea. Dr. Kane says on page 379, I cannot imagine what becomes of the ice. A strong current sets in constantly to the north, but from altitudes of more than 500 feet, I saw only narrow strips of ice with great spaces of open water from 10 to 15 miles in breadth between them. It must, therefore, either go to an open space in the north or dissolve. I remember that neither my father nor myself had tasted food for almost 30 hours. Perhaps this was because of the tension of excitement about our strange voyage in waters farther north, my father said, than anyone had ever been before. Active mentality had dulled the demands of the physical needs. Instead of the cold being intense as we had anticipated, it was really warmer and more pleasant than it had been while in Hammerfest on the north coast of Norway some six weeks before. Captain Peary's second voyage relates another circumstance which may serve to confirm a conjecture which has long been maintained by some, that an open sea free of ice exists at our near pole. On the 2nd of November, says Peary, the wind freshened up to a gale from north by west, lowered the thermometer before midnight to 5 degrees, whereas a rise of wind at Melville Island was generally accompanied by a simultaneous rise in the thermometer at low temperatures. May not this, he asks, be occasioned by the wind blowing over an open sea in the quarter from which the wind blows, and tend to confirm the opinion that at or near the pole an open sea exists? We both frankly admitted that we were very hungry and forthwith I prepared a substantial meal from our well-stored larder. When we had partaken heartily of the repast, I told my father I believed I would sleep, as I was beginning to feel quite drowsy. Very well, he replied, I will keep the watch. I have no way to determine how long I slept. I only know that I was rudely awakened by a terrible commotion of the sloop. To my surprise, I found my father sleeping soundly. I cried out lustily to him, and starting up, he sprang quickly to his feet. 
Indeed, had he not instantly clutched the rail, he would certainly have been thrown into the seething waves. A fierce snowstorm was raging. The wind was directly astern, driving our sloop at a terrific speed, and was threatening every moment to capsize us. There was no time to lose. The sails had to be lowered immediately. Our boat was writhing in convulsions. A few icebergs we knew were on either side of us, but fortunately the channel was open directly to the north. But would it remain so? In front of us, girding the horizon from left to right, was a vaporish fog or mist, black as Egyptian night at the water's edge, and white like a steam cloud toward the top, which was finally lost to view as it blended with the great white flakes of falling snow. Whether it covered a treacherous iceberg, or some other hidden obstacle against which our little sloop would dash and send us to a watery grave, or was merely the phenomenon of arctic fog there was no way to, to determine. On the page 284 of his works, Hall writes, From the top of Providence Berg, a dark fog was seen to the north, indicating water. At 10 a.m., three of the men, Kruger, Nindman, and Hobby, went to Cape Lupton to ascertain, if possible, the extent of the open water. On their return, they reported several open spaces and much young ice, not more than a day old, so thin that it was easily broken by throwing pieces of ice upon it. By what miracles we escaped being dashed to utter destruction, I do not know. I remember our little craft creaked and groaned as if joints were breaking. It rocked and staggered to and fro as if clutched by some fierce undertow of whirlpool or maelstrom. Fortunately, our compass had been fastened with long screws to a crossbeam. Most of our provisions, however, were tumbled out and swept away from the deck of the cuddy. And had we not taken the precaution at the very beginning to tie ourselves firmly to the mast of the sloop, we should have been swept into the lashing sea. Above the deafening tumult of the raging waves I heard my father's voice. Be courageous, my son, he shouted. Odin is the god of the waters, the companion of the brave, and he is with us. Fear not. To me it seemed there was no possibility of our escaping a horrible death. The little sloop was shipping water. The snow was falling so fast as to be blinding, and the waves were tumbling over our counters in reckless white-sprayed fury. There was no telling what instant we should be dashed against some drifting ice pack. The tremendous swells would heave us up to the very peaks of mountainous waves, and then plunge us down again, into the depths of the sea's trough, as if our fishing sloop were a fragile shell. Gigantic white-capped waves like veritable walls fenced us in, fore and aft. This terrible, nerve-wracking ordeal, with its nameless horrors of suspense and agony of fear, indescribable, continued for more than three hours, and all the time we were being driven forward at fierce speed. Then suddenly, as if growing weary, as if growing weary of its frantic exertions, the wind began to lessen its fury, and by degrees to die down. At last we were in perfect calm. The fog mist had also disappeared, and before us lay an iceless channel perhaps ten or fifteen miles wide, with a few icebergs far away to our right, and an intermittent archipelago of smaller ones to the left. I watched my father closely, determined to remain silent until he spoke. Presently he untied the rope from his waist and, without saying a word, began working the pumps, which fortunately were not damaged, relieving the sloop of the water it had shipped in the madness of the storm. He put up the sloop sails as calmly as if casting a fishing net, and then remarked that we were ready for a favoring wind when it came. His courage and persistence were truly remarkable. On investigation we found less than one-third of our provisions remaining, while, to our utter dismay, we discovered that our water casks had been swept overboard during the violent plungings of our boat. Two of our water casks were in the main hold. Both were empty. We had a fair supply of food, but no fresh water. I realized at once the awfulness of our position, and presently I was seized with a consuming thirst. It is indeed bad, remarked my father. Let us dry our bedraggled clothing, for we are soaked to the skin. Trust to the god, Odin, my son. Do not give up hope. The sun was beating down slantingly, as if we were in a southern latitude, instead of in the far northland. It was swinging around, its orbit ever visible and rising higher and higher each day, frequently mist-covered, yet always peering through the lacework of clouds like some fretful eye of fate, guarding the mysterious northland and jealously watching the pranks of men. Far to our right, the rays decking the prisms of icebergs were gorgeous. Their reflections emitted flashes of garnet, of diamond, of sapphire, a pyrotechnic panorama of countless colors and shapes, while below could be seen the green-tinted sea and above the purple sky. Beyond the North 
I tried to forget my thirst by busying myself with bringing up some food and an empty vessel from the hold. Reaching over the side rail, I filled the vessel with water for the purpose of laving my hands and face. To my astonishment, when the water came in contact with my lips, I could taste no salt. I was startled by the discovery. Father, I fairly gasped. The water, the water, it is fresh. What, Olaf? exclaimed my father, glancing hastily around. Surely you are mistaken. There is no land. You are going mad. But taste it, I cried. And thus we made the discovery that the water was indeed fresh, absolutely so, without the least briny taste or even the suspicion of a salty flavor. We forthwith filled our two remaining water casks, and my father declared it was a heavenly dispensation of mercy from the gods, Odin and Thor. We were almost beside ourselves with joy, but hunger bade us end our enforced fast. Now that we had found fresh water in the open sea, what might we not expect in this strange latitude, where ship had never before sailed, and the splash of an oar had never been heard? In Volume 1, page 195, Nansen writes, It is a peculiar phenomenon, this dead water. We had at present a better opportunity of studying it than we desired. It occurs where a surface layer of fresh water rests upon the salt water of the sea, and this fresh water is carried along with the ship gliding on the heavier sea beneath it as if on a fixed foundation. The difference between two strata was in this case so great that while we had drinking water on the surface, the water we got from the bottom cock of the engine room was far too salt to be used for the boiler. And so this is what I wanted to mention as well about the other uh, traveler at Melville Island and what he writes in his travels as well, and it comes up in all kinds of Arctic travels, that the icebergs are not salty. And science will tell you that it is frozen ocean that makes icebergs. But go ahead and take some water at your house and put a bunch of salt in it. Mix it thoroughly, stir it thoroughly till you have a good solution. And put it in your deep freezer. And see if your deep freezer pushes the salt out of the ice, as they say that it does. Or if it just freezes into a chunk of salt ice. And he'll get into this, we'll get into this further, that they're using the water from the glaciers to drink from, and it is perfectly clean, and that it can't be frozen seawater. So where is it coming from? And in such abundance. Back to the text. We had scarcely appeased our hunger when a breeze began filling the idle sails and, glancing at the compass, we found the northern point pressing hard against the glass. In response to my surprise, my father said, I have heard of this before. It is what they call the dipping of the needle. We loosened the compass and turned it at right angles with the surface of the sea before its point would free itself from the glass and point accordingly to unmolested attraction. It shifted uneasily and seemed as unsteady as a drunken man, but finally pointed a course. Before this, we thought the wind was carrying us north by northwest, but with the needle free, we discovered, if it could be relied upon, that we were sailing slightly north by northeast. Our course, however, was ever tending northward. In volume 2, pages 18 and 19, Nansen also writes about the inclination of the needle. Speaking of Johnson, his aide, One day, it was November 24th, he came in to supper a little after six, quite alarmed, and said, There has just been a singular inclination of the needle in 24 degrees and remarkably enough, its northern extremity pointed to the east. And we also see this in uh, the Melville Island texts, that they had the same occurrence, and lots of other sailors remark that around that area, around the 75th parallel, 75 latitude and 103 to 105, one, or I should say one, 99 to 105 in longitude, that in that area that the compass begins to waver uh, drastically. We again find in Peary's first voyage, page 67, the following. It had been observed that from the moment they had entered Lancaster Sound, the motion of the compass needle was very sluggish, and both this and its deviation increased as they progressed to the westward, and continued to do so in descending this inlet. Having reached latitude 73 degrees, they witnessed for the first time the curious phenomenon of the directive power of the needle becoming so weak as to be completely overcome by the attraction of the ship, 
so that the needle might now be said to point to the north pole of the ship. The sea was serenely smooth, with hardly a choppy wave, and the wind brisk and exhilarating. So, before we carry on, I'll add to that as well. During the Melville Island expeditions, uh, those sailors, what they would do is get off of their ship and actually go onto the ice or onto the land into a place that was suitable where there was limited magnetic uh, disturbance from other sources. So they learned after a very short time that they needed to get away from any other iron objects and to get a true bearing. And even still, in those locations, they would have major problems. The sea was serenely smooth, with hardly a choppy wave, and the wind brisk and exhilarating. The sun's rays, while striking us aslant, furnished tranquil warmth, and thus time wore on day after day, and we found from the record in our logbook we had been sailing eleven days since the storm in the open sea. By strictest economy, our food was holding out fairly well, but beginning to run low. In the meantime, one of our casks of water had been exhausted, and my father said, We will fill it again. But to our dismay, we found the water was now as salt as in the region of the Lofoten Islands off the coast of Norway. This necessitated our being extremely careful of the remaining cask. I found myself wanting to sleep much of the time, whether it was the effect of the exciting experience of sailing in unknown waters, or the relaxation from the awful excitement incident to our adventure in a storm at sea. On, or due to want of food, I could not say. I frequently lay down on the bunker of our little sloop, and looked far up into the blue dome of the sky. And notwithstanding, the sun was shining far away in the east. I always saw a single star overhead. For several days when I looked for the star, it was always there directly above us. It was now, according to our reckoning, about the first of August. The sun was high in the heavens, and was so bright that I could no longer see the lone star that attracted my attention a few days earlier. One day about this time my, far my father startled me by calling my attention to a novel sight far in front of us, almost at the horizon. It is a mock sun, exclaimed my father. I have read of them. It is called a reflection or mirage, and it will soon pass away. But this dull red false sun, as we supposed it to be, did not pass away for several hours, and while we were unconscious of its emitting any rays of light, still there was no time thereafter when we could not sweep the horizon in front and locate the illumination of the so-called false sun, during a period of at least twelve hours out of every twenty-four. Clouds and mists would at times almost, but never entirely, hide its location. Gradually it seemed to climb higher in the horizon of the uncertain purple sky as we advanced. It could hardly be said to resemble the sun, except in its circular shape, and when not obscured by clouds or the ocean mists, it had a hazy red bronzed appearance, which would change to a white, like a luminous cloud, as if reflecting some greater light beyond. We finally agreed in our discussion of this smoky furnace-colored sun that, whatever the cause of the phenomena, it was not a reflection of our sun, but a planet of some sort, a reality. Nansen, on page 394, says, Today another noteworthy thing happened, which was that about midday we saw the sun, or to be more correct, an image of the sun, for it was only a mirage. A peculiar impression was produced by the sight of that glowing fire lit just above the outermost edge of the ice. According to the enthusiastic descriptions given by many Arctic travelers of the first appearance of this god of life after the long winter night, the impression ought to be one of jubilant excitement. But it was not so in my case. We had not expected to see it for some days yet, so that my feeling was rather one of pain, of disappointment, that we must have drifted farther south than we ought. So, it was with pleasure, I soon discovered that it could not be the sun itself. The mirage was at first a flattened out, glowing red streak of fire on the horizon, and later there were two streaks, the one above the other, with a dark space between, and from the main top I could see four or even five such horizontal lines directly over one another, all of equal length, as if one could imagine a square dull red sun with horizontal dark streaks across it, or the northern lights is what I would add. One day, soon after this, I felt exceedingly drowsy, and fell into a sound sleep, but it seemed that I was almost immediately aroused by my father's vigorous shaking of me by the shoulder and saying, Olaf, awaken! There is land in sight! I sprang to my feet, and oh joy! Joy unspeakable! There, far in the distance, yet directly in our path, were lands jutting boldly into the sea. The shoreline stretched far away to the right of us, as far as the eye could see, and all along the sandy beach were waves breaking into choppy foam. 
receding and then going forward again, ever chanting in monotonous thunder tones the song of the deep. The banks were covered with trees and vegetation. I cannot express my feeling of exultation at this discovery. My father stood motionless with his hand on the tiller, looking straight ahead, pouring out his heart in thankful prayer and thanksgiving to the gods, Odin and Thor. In the meantime, a net which we found in the stowage had been cast, and we caught a few fish that materially added to our dwindling stock of provisions. The compass, which we had fastened back in its place in fear of another storm, was still pointing due north and moving on its pivot, just as it had in Stockholm. The dipping of the needle had ceased. What could this mean? Then, too, our many days of sailing had certainly carried us far past the North Pole, and yet the needle continued to point north. We were sorely perplexed, for surely our direction was now south. Peary's first voyage, page 69, says, On reaching Sir Byram Martin's Island, or Byam Martin's Island, the nearest to Melville, the latitude of the place of observation was 75 degrees 9 minutes and 23 seconds, and the longitude 103 degrees 44 minutes 37 seconds. The dip of the magnetic needle of 88 degrees 25 minutes 58 seconds west and the longitude of 91 degrees 48 minutes, where the last observations on the shore had been made, to 165 degrees 50 minutes and 9 seconds east. At their present station, so that we had, says Peary, in sailing over the space included between these two meridians, crossed immediately northward of the magnetic pole, and had undoubtedly passed over one of those spots upon the globe where the needle would have to be found to vary 180 degrees, or in other words, where the North Pole would have pointed to the south. So obviously I think they're just very confused there. We sailed for three days along the shoreline and came to the mouth of a fjord or river of immense size. It seemed more like a great bay, and into this we turned our fishing craft, the direction being slightly northeast of south. By the assistance of a fretful wind that came to our aid about twelve hours out of every twenty-four, we continued to make our way inland into what afterward proved to be a mighty river, and which we learned was called by the inhabitants Hidekel, or Hidekel. So interesting that they came to the mouth of a mighty river. We continued our journey for ten days thereafter, and found we had fortunately attained a distance inland where ocean tides no longer affected the water, which had become fresh. The discovery came none too soon, for our remaining cask of water was well nigh exhausted. Too soon, for our remaining cask of water was well nigh exhausted. We lost no time in replenishing our casks, and continued to sail farther up the river when the wind was favorable. So something I want to mention here. I think a lot of people think that as you get up to the North Pole that the way that the maps are and the way that it looks on Earth that it looks like it's a very tiny area. When in reality, if you consider the size of things like Lake Ontario or other large bodies, which are really on a map quite tiny bodies, they are tremendous, tremendous size areas of water. Uh, you could be out on them and think that you're out on an ocean. You could be out and not see land for days or weeks, just like you're on the ocean. And so within the interior of the pole there, at the part where the rivers rush into that inward, that inner sea, that northern inner sea, that northern inner sea could be a huge body of water. And you would have, you know, being a sailor, not knowing where you are there, you would easily still think that you're out on the main ocean. The discovery came none too soon. All the banks, great forests, miles in extent could be seen stretching away on the shoreline. The trees were of enormous size. We landed after anchoring near a sandy beach and waded ashore, and were rewarded by finding a quantity of nuts that were very palatable and satisfying to hunger, and a welcome change from the monotony of our stock of provisions. So they found food there. It was about the first September, over five months, we calculated, since our leave-taking from Stockholm. Suddenly we were frightened almost out of our wits by hearing in the far distance the singing of people. Very soon thereafter we discovered a huge ship gliding down the river directly toward us. Those aboard were singing in one mighty chorus that, echoing from bank to bank, sounded like a thousand voices, filling the whole universe with quivering melody. The accompaniment was played on stringed instruments not unlike our harps. It was a larger ship than any we had ever seen and was differently constructed. Asiatic Mythology, Paradise Found, translation by Sace in a book called Records of the Past, we are told of a dwelling which the gods created for the first human beings, a dwelling in which they become great and 
increased in numbers, and the location of which is described in words exactly corresponding to those of the Iranian Indian Chinese Edaic and Aztec literature, namely, in the center of the earth, from Warren. At this particular time, our sloop was becalmed and not far from the shore. The bank of the river, covered with mammoth trees, rose up several hundred feet in beautiful fashion. We seemed to be on the edge of some primeval forest that doubtless stretched far inland. The immense craft paused and almost immediately a boat was lowered and six men of gigantic stature rowed to our little fishing sloop. They spoke to us in a strange language. We knew from their manner, however, that they were not unfriendly. They talked a great deal among themselves, and one of them laughed immoderately, as though in finding us a queer discovery had been made. One of them spied our compass, and it seemed to interest them more than any other part of our sloop. Finally, the leader motioned as if to ask whether we were willing to leave our craft to go on board their ship. "'What say you, my son?' asked my father. "'They cannot do any more than kill us.' "'They seem to be kindly disposed,' I replied. "'Although what terrible giants! "'They must be the select six of the king's crack regiment. "'Just look at their great size.' "'We may as well go willingly, as be taken by force,' said my father, smiling, "'for they are certainly able to capture us.' "'Thereupon he made note by signs that we were ready to accompany them. "'Within a few minutes we were on board the ship.' and a half an hour later our little fishing craft had been lifted bodily out of the water by a strange sort of hook and tackle, and set on board as a curiosity. There were several hundred people on board this, to us mammoth ship, which we discovered was called the Nas, meaning, as we were afterward learned, pleasure, or, to give a better interpretation, pleasure excursion ship. If my father and I were curiously observed by the ship's occupants, the strange race of giants offered us an equal amount of wonderment. Speaking of giants, in some of the other documents that I found, there is another new reference that I've never seen before, where there's a place in Europe where they dug up a, a giant's grave and actually found a 25-foot tall human with 10-foot wide shoulders. So later, at some point, I'll provide that reference. There was not a single man aboard who would not have been measured fully 12 feet in height. They all wore full beards, not particularly long, but seemingly short-cropped. They had mild and beautiful faces, exceedingly fair, with ruddy complexions. The hair and beard of some were black, others sandy, and still others yellow. The captain, as we designated the dignitary in command of the great vessel, was fully a head taller than any of his companions. The women averaged from ten to eleven feet in height. Their features were especially regular and refined, while their complexion was of a most delicate tint heightened by a healthful glow. According to all procurable data, that spot at the era of man's appearance upon the stage was in the now lost Miocene continent, which then surrounded the Arctic Pole. That in that true original Eden, some of the early generations of men attained to a stature and longevity unequaled in any countries known to post-Diluvian history is by no means scientifically incredible. William Warren, Paradise Found. Both men and women seem to possess that particular ease of manner, which we deem a sign of good breeding, and notwithstanding their huge statures, there was nothing about them suggesting awkwardness. As I was a lad in only my nineteenth year, I was doubtless looked upon as a true Tom Thumb. My father, six foot three, did not lift the top of his head above the waistline of these people. Each one seemed to vie with the others in extending courtesies and showing kindness to us. But all laughed heartily, I remember, when they had to improvise chairs for my father and myself to sit at table. They were richly attired in a costume peculiar to themselves and very attractive. The men were clothed in handsomely embroidered tunics of silk and satin and belted at the waist. They wore knee breeches and stockings of a fine texture, while their feet were encased in sandals adorned with gold buckles. We early discovered that gold was one of the most common metals known and that it was used extensively in decoration. Strange as it may seem, neither my father nor myself felt the least bit of solicitude for our safety. 
We have come into our own, my father said to me. This is the fulfillment of the tradition told me by my father and my father's father, and still back for many ge generations of our race. This is, assuredly, the land beyond the north wind. We seemed to make such an impression on the party that we were given specially into the charge of one of the men, Jules Galdia and his wife, for the purpose of being educated in their language, and we on our part were just as eager to learn as they were to instruct. At the captain's command the vessel was swung cleverly about and began retracing its course up the river. The machinery, while noiseless, was very powerful. The banks and trees on either side seemed to rush by. The ship's speed at, t at times surpassed that of any railroad train on which I have ever ridden, at, even here in America. It was wonderful. In the meantime we had lost sight of the sun's rays, but we found a radiance within an em emanating from the dull red sun which had already attracted our attention, now giving out a white light, seemingly from a cloud bank far away in front of us. It dispensed a greater light, I should say, than two full moons on the clearest night. In twelve hours this cloud of whiteness would pass out of sight as if eclipsed, and the twelve hours following corresponded with our night. We early learned that these strange people were worshippers of this great cloud of night. It was the smoky god of the inner world. The ship was equipped with a mode of illumination which I now presume was electricity, but neither my father nor myself at the time were sufficiently skilled in mechanics to understand whence came the power to operate the ship, or to maintain the soft beautiful lights that answered the same purpose of our present methods of lighting the streets of our cities, our houses, and our places of business. It must be remembered, the time of which I write was the autumn of 1829, and we of the outside surface of the earth knew nothing then, so to speak, of electricity. The electricity surcharged condition of the air was a constant vitalizer. I never felt better in my life than during the two years my father and I sojourned on the inside of the earth. To resume my narrative of events, the ship on which we were sailing came to a stop two days after we had been taken on board. My father said as nearly as he could judge we were directly under Stockholm or London. The city we had reached was called Jehu, signifying a seaport town. The houses were largely and beautifully constructed, and quite uniform in appearance, yet without sameness. The principal occupation of the people appeared to be agriculture. The hillsides were covered with vineyards, while the valleys were devoted to the growing of grain. I never saw such a display of gold. It was everywhere. The door casings were inlaid and the tables were veneered with sheetings of gold. Domes of the public buildings were of gold. It was used most generously in the finishings of the great temples of music. Vegetation grew in lavish exuberance, and fruit of all kinds possessed the most delicate flavor. Clusters of grapes four and five feet in length, each grape as large as an orange, and apples larger than a man's head, typified the wonderful growth of all things on the inside of the earth. The great redwood trees of California would be considered mere underbrush compared with the giant forest trees extending for miles and miles in all directions. In many directions along the foothills of the mountains vast herds of cattle were seen during the last day of our travel on the river. So ordinarily when you're hearing this story, you'd be picturing, and the pictures shown, would be of a hollow ball earth, which is, it just looks and seems ludicrous, aside from our knowledge of the fact that the earth is flat. So while you're thinking of this and while you're watching, don't think of it as being in the inside of the ball. Think of it as that you've gone down inside of the earth, inside of caves inside the earth, and that this is where he's finding these things. We heard much of a city called Eden, but we were kept at Jehu for an entire year. By the end of that time, we had learned to speak fairly well the language of this strange race of people, our instructor, Jules Galdia, and his wife exhibited a patience that was truly commendable. One day an envoy from the ruler at Eden came to see us, and for two whole days my father and myself were put through a series of surprising questions. They wished to know from whence we came, what sort of people dwelt without, and what god we worshipped, our religious beliefs, the mode of living in our strange land, and a thousand other things. The compass which we had brought with us attracted special attention. My father and I commented between ourselves on the fact that the compass still pointed north, although we now knew that we had sailed over the curve or over the edge of the Earth's aperture, and were far along southward on the inside of the surface of the Earth's crust. See again, they just misunderstand where they were. 
which according to my father's estimate, my own, is about 300 miles from the inside to the outside. It's no thicker than an eggshell. There's almost as much surface on the inside as the outside. The great luminous cloud, or a ball of dull red fire, fiery red in the mornings and evenings, and during the day giving off a beautiful white light. The smoky god is seemingly suspended in the center of the great vacuum within the earth, and held to its place by the immutable or immutable law of gravitation, or a repellent atmospheric force, as the case may be. I refer to the known power that draws or repels with equal force in all directions. So again, at this time, they just don't understand what they're seeing. Nor do I, if there's some sort of a light source down there. How am I to say how it functions? But we'll see later what this gets into. The base of this electrical cloud or central luminary, the seat of the gods, is dark and non-transparent, save for innumerable small openings, seemingly in the bottom of the great support or altar of the deity, upon which the smoky god rests. And the lights shining through these many openings twinkle at night in all their splendor, and seem to be stars, as natural as the stars we see shining when we're at home in Stockholm, accepting that they appear larger. The smoky god, therefore, with each daily revolution of the earth, appears to come up in the east and go down in the west, the same as our sun does, on the surface. In reality, the people within believe that the smoky god is the throne of their Jehovah, and is stationary, the effect of night and day, therefore, produced by the earth's daily rotation. So is that his interpretation or theirs? I have since discovered that the language of the people of the inner world is much like that of Sanskrit. After we had given an account of ourselves to the emissaries from the central seat of government of the inner continent, and my father had, in his crude way, drawn maps at their request of the outside surface, showing the divisions of land and water and giving the name of each of the continents, large islands and the oceans, we were taken overland to the city of Eden in a conveyance different from anything we have in Europe or America. This vehicle was doubtless some electrical contrivance. It was noiseless and ran on a single iron rail in perfect balance. The trip was made at a very high rate of speed. We were carried up hills and down dales, across valleys and along the sides of steep mountains, without any apparent attempt having been made to level the earth as we do for railroad tracks. We were taken overland to the city of Eden, in a conveyance different from anything we have in Europe or America. This vehicle was doubtless some electrical contrivance. It was noiseless and ran on a single iron rail in perfect balance. The trip was made at a very high rate of speed. We were carried up hills and down dales, across valleys and along the sides of steep mountains, without any apparent attempt having been made to level the earth as we do for railroad tracks. The car seats were huge yet comfortable affairs, and very high above the floor of the car. On the top of each car were high-geared flywheels lying on their sides, which were so automatically adjusted that, as the speed of the car increased, the high speed of these flywheels increased. We would see that this is exactly the same as the effect that a gyro would have, that it would hold the cart perfectly level. And that would perfectly suit what they're describing here. The surprise of my father and myself was indescribable when, amid the regal magnificence of a spacious hall, we were finally brought before the great high priest, ruler over all the land. He was richly robed and much taller than those about him, and could not have been less than fourteen or fifteen feet in height. The immense room in which we were received seemed finished in solid slabs of gold, thickly studded with jewels of amazing brilliancy. The city of Eden is located in what seems to be a beautiful valley. Yet, in fact, it is on the loftiest mountain plateau of the inner continent, several thousand feet higher than any portion of the surrounding country. It is the most beautiful place I have ever beheld in all my travels. In this elevated garden, all manner of fruits, vines, shrubs, trees, and flowers grow in riotous profusion. In this garden, four rivers have their source in a mighty artesian fountain. They divide and flow in four directions. This place is called by inhabitants the navel of the earth, or the beginning, the cradle of the human race. The names of the rivers are the Euphrates, the Pison, the Gihon, and the Hydekel. And in other pieces, we'll see that 
the four rivers are named uh, the Tigris, the Euphrates, uh, the Gihon, and the Pison. So we'll carry on. And the Lord God planted a garden, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the book of Genesis. The unexpected awaited us in this palace of beauty, in the finding of our little fishing craft. It had been brought before the high priest in perfect shape, just as it had been taken from the waters that day when it was loaded on board the ship by the people who discovered us on the river more than a year before. We were given an audience of over two hours with this great dignitary, who seemed kindly disposed and considerate. He showed himself eagerly interested, asking us numerous questions and invariably regarding things about which his emissaries had failed to inquire. At the conclusion of the interview, he inquired our pleasure, asking us whether we wished to remain in his country or, if we were pre preferred to return to the outer world, providing it were possible to make a successful return trip across the frozen belt barriers that encircle both the northern and southern openings of the earth. My father replied, It would please me and my son to visit your country and see your people, your colleges and palaces of music and art, your great fields, your wonderful forests of timber, and after we have had this pleasurable privilege, we should like to try to return to our home on the outside of the earth. This son is my only child, and my good wife will be wearily waiting our return. I fear you can never return, replied the high chief priest, because the way is a most hazardous one. However, you shall visit the different countries with Jules Galdea as your escort, and be accorded every courtesy and kindness. Whenever you are ready to attempt a return voyage, I assure you that your boat, which is here on exhibition, shall be put in the waters of the river Heidekel, at its mouth, and we will bid you Jehovah's speed. Thus terminated our only interview with the high priest or ruler of the continent. We learned that the males do not marry before they are from 75 to 100 years old, and that the age at which women enter wedlock is only a little less, and that both men and women frequently live to be from six to eight hundred years old, and in some instances much older. Josephus says, God prolonged the life of the patriarchs that preceded the deluge, both on account of their virtues and to give them the opportunity of perfecting the sciences of geometry and astronomy, which they had discovered which they could not have done if they had not lived 600 years, because it is only after the lapse of 600 years that the great year is accomplished. Flammarion, Astronomical Myths, Paris, page 26. During the following year we visited many villages and towns, prominent among them being the cities of Nijai, Delphi, Hectia, and my father was called upon no less than a half dozen times to go over the maps which had been made from the rough sketches he had originally given of the divisions of land and water on the outside. I remember hearing my father remark that the giant race of people in the land of the Smoky God had almost as accurate an idea of the geography of the outside as had the average college professor in Stockholm. In our travels we came to a forest of gigantic trees near the city of Delphi. Had the Bible said there were trees towering over 300 feet in height and more than 30 feet in diameter growing in the Garden of Eden. The Ingersolls, the Tom Paines, and the Voltaires would doubtless have pronounced the statement a myth. Yet this is the description of California Sequoia Gigantea. But these California giants pale into significance when compared with the forest Goliaths found in the within continent, the north continent, where abound mighty trees from 800 to 1,000 feet in height, and from 100 to 120 feet in diameter countless in numbers and forming forests extending hundreds of miles back from the sea. The people are exceedingly musical and learn to a remarkable degree in their arts and science, especially geometry and astronomy. Their cities are equipped with vast palaces of music, where not infrequently as many as 25,000 lusty voices of this giant race swell forth in mighty choruses of the most sublime symphonies. The children are not supposed to attend institutions of learning before they are twenty years old. Then their school life begins and continues for thirty years, ten of which are uniformly devoted by both sexes to the study of music. Their principal vocations are architecture, agriculture, horticulture, the raising of vast herds of cattle, and the building of conveyances particular to that country, for travel on land and water. By some device which I cannot explain, they hold communion with one another between the most distant parts of their country on air currents. 
All buildings are erected with special regard to strength, durability, beauty, and symmetry, and with a style of architecture vastly more attractive to the eye than I have ever observed elsewhere. About three-fourths of the inner surface of the earth is land, and about one-fourth water. There are numerous rivers of tremendous size, some flowing in a northerly direction and others southerly. Some of these rivers are 30 miles in width, and it is out of these vast waterways at the extreme northern, in regions where low temperatures are experienced, that freshwater icebergs are formed. They are then pushed out to sea like huge tongues of ice, by the abnormal freshets of turbulent waters that, twice every year, sweep everything before them. We saw innumerable specimens of bird life, no larger than those encountered in the forests of Europe or America. It is well known that during the last few years, whole species of birds have quit the earth. A writer in a recent article on this subject says, Almost every year sees the final extinction of one or more bird species. Out of 14 varieties of birds found a century since on a single island, the West Indian island of St. Thomas, eight now have to be numbered among the missing. Is it not possible that these disappearing bird species quit their habitation without and find an asylum in the within world? So I think that right here that he's kind of confusing um, the much publicly discussed at that time by uh, Darwin that uh, the extinction of the puffin and other uh, birds in that area that were killed off by sailors um, that, that this is discussed about as an evolutionary thing and that I think that this author feels that it lends w credence to uh, birds going down inside of the earth. So it's just another interesting side note. Whether inland among the mountains or along the seashore, we found bird life prolific. When they spread their great wings, some of the birds appeared to measure 30 feet from tip to tip. They are of great variety and many colors we were permitted to climb up on the edge of a rock and examine a nest of eggs. There were five in the nest, each of which was at least two feet in length and fifteen inches in diameter. After we had been in the city of Hectia about a week, Professor Galdia took us to an inlet, where we saw thousands of tortoises along the sandy shore. I hesitate to state the size of these creatures. They were from twenty-five to thirty feet in length, from fifteen to twenty feet in width, and fully seven feet in height. When one of them projected its head, it had the appearance of some hideous sea monster. The strange conditions within are favorable not only for vast meadows of luxuriant grasses, forests of giant trees, and all manner of vegetable life, but wonderful animal life as well. One day we saw a great herd of elephants. There must have been five hundred of these thunder-throated monsters with their restlessly waving trunks. They were tearing huge bows from the trees and trampling smaller growth into dust like so much hazel brush. They would average over a hundred feet in length and from seventy-five to eighty-five feet in height. It seemed as I gazed upon this wonderful herd of giant elephants that I was again living in the public library at Stockholm, where I had spent much time studying the wonders of the Miocene age. I was filled with mute astonishment, and my father was speechless with awe. He held my arm with a protecting grip, as if fearful harm would overtake us. We were two atoms in this great forest, and fortunately, unobserved by this vast herd of elephants as they drifted on and away, following a leader as does a herd of sheep. They browsed from growing herbage, which they encountered as they traveled, and now again shook the firmament with their deep bellowing. Moreover, there were a great number of elephants in the island, and there was provision for animals of every kind. This is another side note. Also, whatever fragrant things there are in the earth, whether roots or herbage or woods, or distilling drops of flowers or fruits, grew and thrived in that land. The Cratiluo of Plato. There is a hazy mist that goes up from the land each evening, and it invariably rains once every twenty-four hours. This great moisture and invigorating electrical light and warmth accounts, perhaps for the luxuriant vegetation. While the highly charged electrical air and the evenness of climatic conditions may have much to do with giant growth and longevity of all animal life. In places, the level valleys stretched away for many miles in every direction. The smoky god and its clear white light looked calmly down. There was an intoxication in the electrically surcharged air that fanned the cheeks as softly as a vanishing whisper. Nature chanted a lullaby in the faint murmur of winds whose breath was sweet with the fragrance of bud and blossom. After having spent considerably more than a year in visiting several of the many cities of the within world and a great deal of intervening country, 
More than two years had passed from the time we had been picked up by the great excursion ship on the river. We decided to cast our fortunes once more upon the sea and endeavor to regain the outside surface of the earth. We made known our wishes, and they were reluctantly but promptly followed. Our host gave my father, at his request, various maps showing the entire inside of the earth. Its cities, oceans, seas, rivers, gulfs, and bays, they also generously offered to give us all the bags of gold nuggets, some of them as large as a goose's egg, that we were willing to attempt to take with us in our little fishing boat. In due time we returned to Jehu, at which place we spent one month in fixing up and overhauling our little fishing sloop. After all was in readiness, the same ship, Nas, that originally discovered us, took us on board and sailed to the mouth of the river Heidekel. After our giant brothers had launched our little craft for us, they were most cordially regretful at parting, and evinced much solicitude for our safety. My father swore by the gods Odin and Thor that he would surely return again, within a year or two, and pay them another visit, and thus we bade them adieu. We made ready and hoisted our sail, but there was little breeze. We were becalmed within an hour after our giant friends had left us and started on their return trip. The winds were constantly blowing south, that is, they were blowing from the northern opening of the earth toward that which we knew to be south, but which, according to our compass's pointing figure, was directly north. For three days we tried to sail and to beat against the wind, but to no avail, whereupon my father said, My son, to return by the same route as we came is, and is impossible at this time of year. I wonder why we did not think of this before. We have been here almost two and a half years. Therefore, this is the season when the sun is beginning to shine in at the southern opening of the earth. The long cold night is on in the Spitsbergen country. What shall we do? I inquired. There is only one thing we can do, my father replied, and that is to go south. Accordingly, he turned the craft about, gave it full reef, and started by the compass north, but in fact directly south. The wind was strong, and we seemed to have struck a current that was running with remarkable swiftness in the same direction. In just forty days, we arrived at Delphi, a city we had visited in company with our guides, Jules Galdia and his wife, near the mouth of the Gahan River. Here we stopped for two days and were most hospitably entertained by the same people who had welcomed us on our former visit. We laid in some additional provision and again set sail following the needle due north. On our outward trip we came through a narrow channel, which appeared to be a separating body of water between two considerable bodies of land. There was a beautiful beach to our right, and we decided to reconnoiter. Casting anchor, we waited ashore to rest up a day before continuing the outward hazardous undertaking. We built a fire and threw on some sticks of dry driftwood. While my father was walking along the shore, I prepared a tempting repaste from plies we had provided. There was a mild, luminous night, which my father said resulted from the sun shining in from the south aperture of the earth. That night we slept soundly and awakened the next morning as refreshed as if we had been in our own beds at Stockholm. After breakfast we started out on an island tour of discovery, but had not gone far when we sighted some birds which we recognized at once as belonging to the penguin family. They are flightless birds, but excellent swimmers and tremendous in size, with white breast, short wings, black head, and long peaked bills. They stand fully nine feet high. They looked at us with little surprise and presently waddled rather than walked toward the water and swam away in a northerly direction. The nights are never so dark at the poles as in other regions, for the moon and stars seem to possess twice as much light and effulgence. In addition, there is a continuous light, the varied shades and play of which are amongst the strangest phenomena of nature. Rambrossen's Astronomy the events that occurred during the following hundred or more days beguard description. We were on an open and iceless sea, the month we reckoned to be November or December, and we knew the so-called South Pole was turned toward the sun. Therefore, when passing out and away from the internal electrical light of the smoky god and its genial warmth, we would be met by the light and warmth of the sun, shining in through the south opening of the earth. We were not mistaken. The fact that gives the phenomenon of the polar aurora is greatest importance is that the earth becomes self-luminous that besides the light which as a planet is received from the central body it shows a capability of sustaining a luminous process proper to itself humble so i think that here he's either become extremely confused or he has if this story is true um it, it could be that uh 
that his, someone has told him to come up with this story that they popped out at the South Pole to properly confuse us. Because everything up to that point went with the rest of our research. And then at the end of it now, it seems to be coming back on itself and destroying itself. Quite common in these uh, let out the information and then destroy it uh, exercises that they do. So carrying on, they're supposed to be at the, at the South Pole now leaving. But what we'll see is that it sounds more like they were at the North still. There were times when our little craft, driven by wind that was continuous and persistent, shot through the waters like an arrow. Indeed, had we encountered a hidden rock or obstacle, our little vessel would have been crushed into kindling wood. At last we were conscious that the atmosphere was growing decidedly colder, and a few days later icebergs were sighted far to the left. My father argued, and correctly, that the winds which filled our sails came from the warm climate within. The time of the year was certainly most auspicious for us to make our dash for the outside world, and attempt to scud our fishing sloop through open channels of the frozen zone which surrounds the polar regions. We were soon amid the ice packs, and how our little craft got through the narrow channels and escaped being crushed, I know not. The compass behaved in the same drunken and unreliable fashion in passing over the southern curve or edge of the Earth's shell, as it had done on our inbound trip at the northern entrance. So I think it's just, they're at the north still. They, they took them back to the river Heidekel and pushed them out. So they wouldn't have taken them somewhere else. It gyrated, dipped, and seemed like a thing possessed, the compass. Captain Sabina on page 105 in Voyages in the Arctic Regions says, The geographical determination of the direction and intensity of the magnetic forces at different points of the Earth's surface has been regarded as an object worthy of special research. To examine in different parts of the globe the declination, inclination, and intensity of the magnetic force and their periodical and secular variations and mutual relations and dependencies could be duly investigated only in fixed magnetical observatories. So I'll tell you guys a little interesting story there. When you look at aeronautical maps over the earth for military applications, you'll notice that there's lots of places where they say magnetic variance or magnetic disturbance. And these are huge areas where it's always a large rock piling. Uh, when you look at the areas that, you're, that you'll see this in, there it always seems to be a, a semi-mountainous area that sticks out of the ground and is, is highly rocky. Um, and you'll see it in the Canadian Shield and in many other places where it's been noted that as they're going over, their compasses will spin for a bit and then go back to normal. Or that they, the declination goes way off because of a, a strange magnetic variation in that location. So, as we've seen before in other of my documentaries, it's easily explicable as just the the changing magnetic pace of the earth that the earth itself is filled with this magnetic uh, force that is not necessarily locked to any position I'm not talking about the north pole here I'm talking about the magnetic net that surrounds us and wraps through us that there are certain points where uh, magnetic lines will overlap and make small extra magnetic resonances especially to a compass okay so one day as I was lazily looking over the sloop side into the clear waters my father shouted breakers ahead looking up I saw through a lifting mist a white object that towered several hundred feet high completely shutting off our advance we lowered sail immediately and none too soon in a moment we found ourselves wedged between two monstrous icebergs each was crowding and grinding against its fellow mountain of ice. They were like two gods of war contending for supremacy. We were greatly alarmed. Indeed, we were between the lines of a battle royal. The sonorous thunder of the grinding ice was like the continued volleys of artillery. Blocks of ice larger than a house were frequently lifted up a hundred feet by the mighty force of lateral pressure. They would shudder and rock to and fro for a few seconds, then come crashing down with a deafening roar and disappear into the foaming waters. Thus, for more than two hours, the contest of the icy giants continued. 
it seemed as if the end had come. The ice pressure was terrific, and while we were not caught in the dangerous part of the jam, and were safe for the time being, yet the heavy heaving and rending of tons of ice as it fell splashing here and there into the watery depths filled us with shaking fear. Finally, to our great joy, the grinding of the ice ceased, and within a few hours the great mass slowly divided, and, as if in an act of providence had been performed, right before us lay an open channel. Should we venture with our little craft into this opening? If the pressure came on again, our little sloop as well as ourselves would be crushed into nothingness. We decided to take the chance, and accordingly hoisted our sail to a favoring breeze, and soon started out like a racehorse, running the gauntlet of this unknown narrow channel of open water. For the next forty-five days our time was employed in dodging icebergs and hunting channels. Indeed, had we not been favored with a strong south wind and a small boat, I doubt if this story could have ever been given to the world. At last there came a morning when my father said, My son, I think we are to see home. We are almost through the ice. See, the open water lies before us. However, there were a few icebergs that had floated far northward into the open water still ahead of us on either side, stretching away for many miles. Directly in front of us and by the compass, which had now righted itself due north, there was an open sea. What a wonderful story we have to tell the people of Stockholm, continued my father, while a look of pardonable elation lighted up his honest face. And think of the gold nugget stowed away in the hold. I spoke kind words of praise to my father, not alone for this fortitude and endurance, but also for his courageous daring as a discoverer, and for having made the voyage that now promised a successful end. I was grateful, too, that he had gathered the wealth of gold we were carrying home. While congratulating ourselves on the goodly supply of provisions and water we still had on hand, and on the dangers we had escaped, we were startled by hearing a most terrific explosion caused by the tearing apart of huge mountain of ice. It was a deafening roar like the firing of a thousand cannon. We were sailing at the time with great speed, and happened to be near a monstrous iceberg, which to all appearances was immovable as a rock-bound island. It seemed, however, that the iceberg had split and was breaking apart, whereupon the balance of the monster along the ice which we were sailing was destroyed, and it began dipping from us. My father quickly anticipated the danger before I realized its awful possibilities. The iceberg extended down into the water many hundreds of feet, and as it tipped over, the portion coming up out of the water caught our fishing craft like a lever on a fulcrum and threw it into the air as if it had been a football. Our boat fell back on the iceberg that by this time had changed the side next to us, for the top. My father was still in the boat, having become entangled in the rigging, while I was thrown some twenty feet away. I quickly scrambled to my feet and shouted to my father, who answered, All is well! Just then a realization dawned upon me. Horror upon horror! The blood, the blood froze in my veins. The iceberg was still in motion, and its great weight and force in topping over would cause it to submerge temporarily. I fully realized what a sucking maelstrom it would produce amid the worlds of water on every side. They would rush into the depression in all their fury, like white-fanged wolves eager for human prey. In this supreme moment of mental anguish, I remember glancing at our boat, which was lying on its side, and wondering if it could possibly right itself, and if my father could escape. Was this the end of our struggles and adventures? Was this his death? All these questions flashed through my mind in the fraction of a second and a moment later I was engaged in a life-and-death struggle. The ponderous monolith of ice sank below the surface, and the frigid waters gurgled around me in frenzied anger. I was in a saucer, with the waters pouring in on every side. A moment more and I lost consciousness. But when I partially recovered my senses, and roused from the swoon of a half-drowned man, I found myself wet, stiff, and almost frozen, lying on the iceberg. There, but there was no sign of my father, or of our little fishing sloop. The monster berg had recovered itself, and, with its new balance, lifted its head perhaps fifty feet above the waves. The top of this island of ice was a plateau perhaps half an acre in extent. I loved my father well, and was grief-stricken at the awfulness of his death. I railed at fate that I, too, had not been permitted to sleep with him in the depths of the ocean. Finally, I climbed to my feet and looked about me. The purple domed sky above, the shoreless green ocean beneath, and an occasional iceberg discernible. My heart sank in hopeless despair. I cautiously picked my way across the berg toward the other side, hoping that our fishing craft had righted itself. Dared I think it possible that my father still lived? It was but a ray of hope that flamed up in my heart. 
but the anticipation warmed my blood in my veins and started it rushing, like some rare stimulant, through every fiber of my body. I crept close to the precipitous side of the iceberg and peered far down, hoping, still hoping. Then I made a circle of the berg, scanning every foot of the way, and thus I kept going around and around. One part of my brain was certainly becoming maniacal, while the other part, I believe, and due to this day, was perfectly rational. I was conscious of having made the circuit a dozen times, and while one part of my intelligence knew in all reason there was not a vestige of hope, yet some strange fascinating aberration bewitched and compelled me still to beguile myself with expectation. The other part of my brain seemed to tell me that while there was no possibility of my father being alive yet, if I quit making the circuitous pilgrimage, if I paused for a single moment, it would be acknowledgment of defeat, and should I do this, I felt that I should go mad. Thus, hour after hour, I walked around and around, afraid to stop and rest, yet physically powerless to continue much longer. O oh, horror of horrors, to be cast away in this wide expanse of waters without food or drink, and only a treacherous iceberg for an abiding place! My heart sank within me, and all semblance of hope was fading into black despair. Then the hand of the deliverer was extended, and the death-like stillness of a solitude rapidly becoming unbearable was suddenly broken by the firing of a signal gun. I looked up in startled amazement when I saw less than a half mile away a whaling vessel bearing down toward me with her sail full set. Evidently my continued activity on iceberg had attracted their attention. On drawing near they put out a boat, and descending cautiously to the water's edge I was rescued, and a little later lifted on board the whaling ship. I found it was Scotch whaler the Arlington. She had cleared from Dundee in September and started immediately for the Antarctic, in search of whales. The captain, Angus MacPherson, seemed kindly disposed, but in matters of discipline, as I soon learned, possessed of an iron will. When I attempted to tell him that I had come from the inside of the earth, the captain and mate looked at each other, shook their heads, and insisted on me being put in a bunk under strict surveillance of the ship's physician. I was very weak for want of food and had not slept for many hours. However, after a few days' rest, I got up one morning and dressed myself without asking permission of the physician or anyone else, and told them that I was as sane as anyone. The captain sent for me and again questioned me concerning where I had come from, and how I came to be alone on an iceberg in the far-off Antarctic Ocean. I replied that I had just come from the inside of the earth, and proceeded to tell him how my father and myself had gone in by way of Spitsbergen and come out by way of the South Pole whereupon I was put in irons. I afterward heard the captain tell the mate that I was as crazy as a March hare, and I must remain in confinement until I was rational enough to give a truthful account of myself. Finally, after much pleading and many promises, I was released from irons. I then and there decided to invent some story that would satisfy the captain, and never again refer to my trip to the land of the Smoky God, at least until I was safe among friends. Within a fortnight I was permitted to go about and take my place as one of the seamen. A little later the captain asked me for an explanation. I told him that my experience had been so horrible that I was fearful of my memory, and begged him to permit me to leave the question unanswered until some time in the future. I think you are recovering considerably, he said, but you are not sane yet by a good deal. Permit me to do such work as you may assign, I replied, and if it does not compensate you sufficiently, I will pay you immediately after I reach Stockholm, to the last penny. And thus the matter rested. On finally reaching Stockholm, as I have already related, I found that my good mother had gone to her reward more than a year before. I have also told how, later, the treachery of a relative landed me in a madhouse, where I remained for twenty-eight years, seemingly unending years, and still later after my release how I returned to the life of a fisherman, following it sedulously for 27 years. Then how I came to America, and finally to Los Angeles, California. But all this can be of little interest to the reader. Indeed, it seems to me the climax of my wonderful travels and strange adventures was reached when the Scotch sailing vessel took me from an iceberg on the Antarctic Ocean. Authors Afterward I found much difficulty in deciphering and editing the manuscripts of Olaf Janssen. However, I have taken the liberty of reconstructing only a very few expressions, and in doing this have in no way changed the spirit or meaning. Otherwise, the original text has neither been added to nor taken from. It is impossible for me to express my opinion as to the value or reliability of the wonderful statements made by Olaf Janssen. 
the description here given of the strange lands and people visited by him, the location of the cities, the names and the directions of rivers, and other information herein combined, conform in every way to the rough drawings given to my custody by this ancient Norseman, which drawings together with the manuscript it is my intention at some later date to give to the Smithsonian Institution, to preserve for the benefit of those interested in the mysteries of the farthest north, the frozen circle of silence. It is certain that there are many things in Vedic literature, in Josephus, the Odyssey, the Iliad, Terrien de la Coupery's Early History of Chinese Civilization, Flammarion's Astronomical Myths, Lenormant's Beginning of the History, Hesiod's Theogony, Sir John de Mandeville's writings, and Sace's Record of the Past, that, to say the least, are strangely in harmony with the seemingly incredible text in the yellow manuscript of the old Norseman, Olaf Jansen, and now for the first time given to the world. In concluding this history of my adventures, I wish to state that I firmly believe science is yet in its infancy concerning the cosmology of the earth. There is so much that is unaccounted for by the world's accepted knowledge of today, and will ever remain so until the land of the smoky god is known and recognized by our geographers. It is the land from whence came the great logs of cedar that have been found by explorers in open waters far over the northern edge of the earth's crust and also the bodies of mammoths whose bo bones are found in vast beds on the Siberian coast. Northern explorers have done much. Sir John Franklin, de Havilland Grinnell, Sir John Murray, Kane, Melville, Hall, Nansen, Schwatka, Greeley, Peary, Ross, Gerlach, Bernacki, Andre, Amston, Amundsen, and others have all been striving to storm the frozen citadel of mystery. I firmly believe that Andre and two brave companions, Strindberg and Franknell, who sailed away in the balloon Orion from the northwest coast of Spitsbergen on that Sunday afternoon of July 1897, are now in the within world, and doubtless are being entertained, as my father and myself were entertained, by the kind-hearted giant race inhabiting the inner Atlantic continent. Having, in my humble way, devoted years to these problems, I am well acquainted with the accepted definition of gravity as well as the cause of the magnetic needle's attraction, and I am prepared to say that it is my firm belief that the magnetic needle is influenced solely by electric currents, which completely envelop the earth like a garment, and that these electric currents in an endless circuit pass out of the southern end of the earth's opening, diffusing and spreading themselves over all the outside surface, and rushing madly on in their course toward the north pole. And while these currents seemingly dash off into space at the earth's curve or edge, yet they drop again to the inside surface and continue their way southward along the inside of the Earth's crust, toward the opening. Mr. Lemstrom concluded that an electric discharge, which could only be seen by means of the spectroscope, was taking place on the surface of the ground all around him, and that from a distance it would appear as a faint display of aurora, the phenomena of pale and flaming light which is sometimes seen on the top of the Spitsbergen Mountains, from the Arctic. As to gravity, no one knows, because it has not been determined whether it is atmospheric pressure that causes the apple to fall, or whether 150 miles below the surface of the earth, supposedly one half way through, there exists some powerful lodestone attraction that draws it. Therefore, whether the apple, when it leaves the limb of the tree, is drawn or impelled downward to the nearest point of resistance is unknown to the students of physics. The valleys of this inner Atlantis continent bordering the upper waters of the farthest north are in season covered with the most magnificent and luxuriant flowers. Not hundreds and thousands, but millions of acres from which the pollen or blossoms are carried far away, in almost every direction, by the earth's spiral gyrations and the agitation of the wind. And it is these blossoms or pollen from the vast floral mount meadows within that produce the colored snows of the Arctic regions that have so mystified the northern explorers. Kane, volume 1, page 54, says, We passed the crimson cliffs of Sir John Ross in the forenoon of August 5th. The patches of red snow from which they derive their name could be seen clearly at the distance of 10 miles from the coast. Le Cham, in an account of André's balloon expedition, on page 144, says, On the Isle of Amsterdam, the snow is tinted with red for a considerable distance, and the savants are collecting it to examine it microscopically. It presents, in fact, certain peculiarities. It is thought that it contains very small plants. 
Scorby, the famous whaler, had already remarked this. Beyond question, this new land within is the home, the cradle of the human race, and viewed from the standpoint of the discoveries made by us, must of necessity have a most important bearing on all physical, paleontological, archaeological, philological, and mythological theories of antiquity. The same idea of going back to the land of mystery, to the very beginning, to the origin of man, is found in Egyptian traditions of the earlier terrestrial regions of the gods, heroes and men from the historical fragments of Manetho, fully verified by the historical records taken from the more recent excavations of Pompeii, as well as traditions of the North American Indians. It is now one hour past midnight. The new year of 1908 is here, and this is the third day thereof. And having at last finished the record of my strange travels and adventures, I wish given to the world, I am ready and even longing for the peaceful rest which I am sure will follow life's trials and vicissitudes. I am old in years, and ripe both with adventures and sorrows, yet rich with the few friends I have cemented to me, in my struggles to lead a just and upright life. Like a story that is well nigh told, my life is ebbing away. The presentiment is strong within me that I shall not live to see the rising of another sun. Thus do I conclude my message. Olaf Jansen The descendants of those uh, blonde, tall people whose mummies were found in Egypt, that's why they were...